my message is how to survive your struggle with the fools in your life. How to survive your struggle with the fools in your life. Fools invite scrutiny. Their mysterious and curiosity reaches for understanding. Fools don't appear like fools. Often they have PhDs. King James Version said some of them are made judges. Bill O'Reilly, the commentator and host of the O'Reilly Factor on Fox News, has been concentrating on the judges in the state of Vermont. His concern is over them giving men who rape children and molest children 16 weeks in jail, probation, and the Vermont governor and senators and et cetera are quite infuriated that he would magnify their character and bring the nation's attention to it. Fools are often promoted in position because they can remain undetected for months and years. Fools do not wear dunce hats. Fools cannot be discerned by age. Job said great men are not always wise. And this is a fascinating insight. He said the aged, the aged don't understand judgment. <laughs> now you'd think teenagers don't. Fools break your focus. Fools waste valuable time and energy. Fools slow your life down. Fools rob you of precious moments. There's 40-something facts we don't have enough time to cover, but they're all listed here. The Bible says a fool should never be given a position of leadership over others. Proverbs 24, 7, wisdom is too high for a fool. He openeth not his mouth in the gate. In the ancient days, the wise elders of the city met at the gates of the city. Remember the Proverbs 31, 1, husband, woman. Fools were never welcome to a given position of influence there. The continuous threat of pain is the only influence that keeps a fool in his place. Proverbs 26.3, a whip for the horse, a bridle for the ass, and a rod for the fool's back. Then it has another interesting statement. Because the Bible indicates that even discipline doesn't change a fool. Proverbs 17, 10, a fool, a reproof entereth into a wise man, more into a wise man than a hundred stripes into a fool. My goal this morning in these few moments with you is to aid you in your struggle to survive them. I have not been able to escape fools. They find me like a fly finds food, like a moth finds the flame. Fools seem to reach me quicker than the wise. I'm hesitant to name fools but I'm swift to identify them. I haven't been. Hope is a mesmerizing potion. 
Hope is a medicine that can deprive you of reality. Someday, just before I die, I'm going to publish a book that I don't mind people reading without me here. It's going to be the, the flesh side of wisdom. I've got a lot of one-liners. Hope is the proof of inexperience. It's one of them. <laughs> the Bible says there's no hope for a fool. And that's where you're going to miss it. And this is why I feel very provoked to address in your life the uh, the capability, the developed ability to discern fools. Not people who do foolish things. Everyone does foolish things. Not those moments when we make a mistake in judgment. Not a moment we seem blinded to reality. Not make an investment that we lose money on. I'm not talking about acts and moments when you make a mistake. Those, a mistake doesn't make you a fool. Inexperience doesn't make you a fool. So when I address the subject of fools today, I'm addressing it to salvage your energy, to unclutter your life of unnecessary investment, wasted investment. I have done many foolish things, and among the top three is invest time in fools. I would consider the biggest struggle of the learner's mind is wanting to impart your wisdom and knowledge to others incapable of receiving it. If you want to learn, you eventually will want to influence. If you learn something, you're going to want to share it and influence somebody else with it. Now, the passion levels are different. I marvel that some men do not write books. I am thrust to write. It is not easy for me to write. It's a struggle to write. It's labor to write. But in my effort to dilute pain, in my passion to help people avoid failure, I document revelation so that men can discover and change. You must recognize a fool, and there's 40-something ways to do that. Why should you recognize a fool? Because a fool will mute and neutralize your momentum. Fools distract you, discourage you, demoralize you, disappoint you. Every moment with the fool is a moment lost with a seeker. Somebody will fail if you stay preoccupied with a fool. Fools do not wear dunce hats. Fools often wear Ties and shirts, classy. Fools disguise themselves. Fools do not know they are fools. Fools often think they're wiser than everyone around them. Fools are not learners, but they are influencers. They're persuaders without a righteous purpose. 
Fools can appear articulate, skillful, masterful. Fools are not without gifts. They're simply without character. Fools have potential. And it is possible that you can enter the the season of being a fool. And the only thing that corrects a fool is pain. Loss. Nebuchadnezzar. God invested seven years of him out in the field. Remember that with his claws, his fingernails growing out like an animal. How do you survive your struggle with the fools in your life? I do not recognize fools quickly. I'm struggling to identify them because they brought so much pain in my life. Are you assigned to a fool? No. They have to learn from their own pain and loss. I want to give you seven or eight things that will not change a fool. And I'm saying this so you can stop trying so hard. Some of you can't grasp that you produce through your loins a fool, but you did. Some of you can hardly grasp that a fool came through your blood, but they did. Some of you are so overdosed with mercy, you won't accept that you have a fool in your life. Some of you erroneously are persuaded that if you try hard enough, you can change a fool. I went to correct a preacher one time that had been in the ministry for many, many years, over 40 years, and the Holy Spirit stopped me and said, do you believe that you can do in a conversation what I haven't done in a thousand? (laughs) A fascinating phrase in the King James Version, Old Testament says, let... Ephraim alone. One of the most brilliant preachers that runs thousands, over 10,000 is church, I heard this week say, God never gives up on you. What an idiotic statement. It looks like he's read so little of Scripture. <laughs> It's obvious he hadn't got past chapter 2 yet in Genesis. <laughs> Certainly hadn't got to the book of Acts. With that a nice and so I hadn't even reached numbers yet. Bless his heart, he must be in Psalms. He must be preoccupied with Psalms. The psalmist crying out. Yes, God gives up on people like he gave up on Lucifer and never offered him a chance for restoration and repentance. How do you survive? If you have one in your family and their entry always births turbulence in the environment. Their words stir up strife. Their sneer. Disguising their lack of character. How do you survive a fool in your bloodline? A niece, a nephew, a brother, a sister, an aunt, or an uncle. Moving helps. (laughs) 
abbreviating conversations aid? How do you survive them? How do you, how do you work with this passion in you to change? And compassion, which is the irresistible urge to heal pain. I was thinking this morning when I was loading up my car. How do you deal with somebody in your bloodline? You see potential, but not passion. You see possibility, but you don't see character. I called one of my protege ministers in some months ago. And I said, you're a con artist. You're a liar. You're a fraud. You're a deceiver. You're an absolute idiot. What is wrong with you? I had two others to document so they would know that he had been exposed and I had confronted him. Confrontation. Confrontation is an attempt to preserve a relationship. Confrontation is a seed for change. Confrontation is an impartation of, of knowledge and insight. It's to show you what I've discovered about you. I walked him through his eras. I'd known him for many years and love him. I love him to this day. This is going to shock you, but love doesn't help a fool. You can be in love with something that destroys you. You can be fascinated with something that's going to mess your head up ferociously. Every tragedy begins with a conversation. Every change begins with a conversation. Every miracle begins with conversation. Words decide seasons. How do you survive? A fool produces indescribable waves of hopelessness in you. You can become suicidal as well as homicidal. I suggest before you ever commit suicide, take care of the one who drove you to it. Don't leave the world alone. Remove the world of the thorn That's joking, you that are watching globally. <laughs> that's teasing. Got to remember that. The voice of a fool is intriguing, fascinating. A fool's voice has a mesmerizing quality. The serpent was more magnetized more magnetizing and mesmerizing than everything else in the garden. Fools do not appear as fools. They don't even talk like fools. They appear to be the voice of influence and knowledge. They're camouflaged. They're disguised. What you do reveals what you are. What you believe reveals your character. I'm the kind of guy that'd rather have three good friends than a thousand false ones. Amen. I'm into real. I don't wear fake jewelry either. I'm into authentic. How do you survive in the struggle? This has been the challenge of my life in the last few weeks. 
unknowingly, it's been the challenge of my life for 60 years. But I didn't know that that's what my struggle was. Your greatest struggle today is surviving fools. Your conscience tells you God's standard. Identify discomfort in your conscience. Confront it. Remove any influence that brings guilt in your life. Your struggle is how do you remove the guilt for leaving them the way they are. Your struggle is with your sense of inadequacy. Why can I not change them? What's wrong with me that my presence hasn't brought change? What is wrong in my character? Am I stupid? Am I idiotic? Haven't you felt that way with some of your children? Did I not say it clearly? Did I not say it enough? Did I not say it with enough passion? Why is my voice so weak in the heart of my son? Why has my lifestyle not impacted my children? Why has my passion left others unaffected? Am I so weak? Am I so unpersuasive? What is wrong with me? God experienced such exasperation. Why do the grapes grow wild? He cries this out in the Old Testament. I've watered the garden. I fertilized it. I've pruned the grapes and the plants. Why do they grow wild? Did a son come through my loins that acts like that? Did they fall on their head out of the high chair? What did I do wrong? Every pastor feels that. When he has labored and toiled and poured his entire life to form a body of Christ and to establish and dominate his turf with God imprints, to create memories of God's presence. He's prayed, he's fasted, he's sought God. He spent thousands of hours to search for truth, not only for himself, because the struggle to get to heaven is not a great struggle. The struggle to bring others is where the burden is. The Bible calls it the burden of the Lord. When I travel with several of my team, it's quite stressful. Traveling alone is quite easy. But every person you add because you have to take care of everybody with you. You really do. You have to take care of every cotton-picking blessed one of them. They'll be late, won't show up, won't be in time, won't eat, won't, won't forget to tip the sky cap, the bellman. I, anytime you travel with a group, you've multiplied the burden for every person with you, especially when you're the one writing the check. If you're trying to get to heaven, that's one thing. But when you're trying to bring others, that's another thing. Some of you have a burden. Some of you are laboring under such a stress and you're saying, what's wrong? You're trying to bring a fool into a future they hadn't qualified for. You're trying to bring a fool into a future they don't even want. <laughs> they don't even want it. I have poured 40 years of research and 12,000 books into a little thing called the Millionaire 300. There will be people that think $300 for 40 years of knowledge is too much. I 
They don't even want it. I want to give you seven or eight things that you must accept if you're going to enter your future without the weightiness of the barnacles of the ship on the bottom. Every ship owner knows this, that as he sails the sea, there are things that fascinate to the bottom of that ship. And they have to take it out of the water, cut all the barnacles off, so the ship and the boat can sail again. Some of you have lost speed. Some of you has lost hope. And you think it's you. But you're trying to drag a fool into your future. There comes a time like Abraham that you must look at the lot in your life and say, let's part. Let's part ways. Access will not change a fool. Access, proximity to you will not change a fool. It is customary, we'll go over time another 10 minutes or so, 15. It is customary to think if you could spend more time with someone, you could create change. We know the power of time. We know the influence of exposure. We know the advantage of access. We see what access can do in Scripture. We see that if... I never tire of the wisdom of God. Wisdom is the ability to recognize difference, right and wrong, evil and righteousness, difference in people, difference in a countenance, difference in a moment, like the blind man crying out to Jesus. The dominant purpose for wisdom, and don't you love the wisdom of God? So thankful you're listening today and watching and being a part of the internet, telling others about it. And I hope you're getting, by the way, I hope you're getting my daily podcast every single day on your iPod or your MP3, every single day, two minutes of wisdom. Be a blessing. Sometimes I go a little over because I get excited. I want you to be a part of this ministry. I believe that when you get involved with God, he gets involved with you. I am one of the ministers of the gospel who believe the words of Jesus. I believe every word he said. When he told Peter that there would be a hundredfold return on any investment in the gospel, in Mark 10, 28 through 30, I believed him. When the word of God says in Malachi 3, that if I bring the tithe, which is 10% of my income, and the offering back to him, that he would open the windows of heaven and pour me out a blessing I don't have room enough to receive, I believe him. Why would I believe God about heaven and hell and not believe him about the blessing of the Lord? I want to pray over the seeds that you have been planting in this ministry. And by the way, I have an incredible gift you're going to love. In fact, it's probably one of the greatest gifts I've ever offered. We're asking the Holy Spirit for 300 partners this week who will set aside a seed of $300 for our outreaches. I need your help. I want you to help me. Not just to feed a thousand children a day, which we do, or a thousand families, or underwrite the wisdom of Asia Bible College, or to underwrite the tent factory in South Africa, or the home of hope, but that we can go into 100 countries with the gospel. I'm holding in my hand the wisdom quick scan Bible. The wisdom quick scan Bible. I have never in my life found a Bible easier to read. As you know, for many years, I've read the Bible through 40 chapters a day, every single month of my life. There is no easier book to read than this quick scan Bible. When I found out that I could offer it to you inside of some of the teaching that I've been doing and I'll do today, I want you to have it. Call me right now, plant your seed of 300 and watch God move. We know the power of time. 
We know the influence of exposure. We know the advantage of access. We see what access can do in Scripture. We see that if you can hear the right voice, it can be such a, so different. We know what access did when the handmaiden of Naaman, the Syrian leper, when her words were spoken to his ears, we know that hope got there and he got to the prophet and he dipped in Jordan seven times. We know what access did for the blind man who cried out, Jesus, thou son of David. We have seen in scripture what the woman with the issue of blood for 12 years, what happened when she had access to touch his garment. We know the potential power for change through access. When the thief next to Christ who fascinates me, it's worth writing a book on, when he sees Jesus and he's there, and he had seen him before, but access. We know what access to Elijah did for the widow of Zarephath. We know what access did in the life of Zacchaeus in the tree. We know the power of access. It's what makes me get up early and drive through five towns to get to the Wisdom Center by 9 o'clock every day on Sundays. I know. It's why I'm flying to Orlando tonight. It, we know the advantage of access. So we find it puzzling, baffling, and even infuriating that access to us wouldn't create a change. You can date somebody for seven years and see no changes. You can raise a daughter for 18 years and see no changes. God has the same turbulence in his spirit. Paul experienced the same exa exasperation. Why? Well, there's another voice in your life, he writes Galatians. He says, who, who hindered you? Somebody else has been talking to you. There's been a third voice in your life. Somebody has muted my influence. Somebody has neutralized what I'm sorry. Somebody else has been talking to you. You've listened to another. Demas had access to Paul, but it didn't change. Two, correction does not change a fool. Correction does not change a fool. The Bible says correction will affect a wise person, and that's how you know the wise from the fools, their reaction to correction. All I have to do to identify the idiots on my staff and team and in this church and in my life is give them a simple instruction. The Bible says a hundred stripes on the back of a fool will not change him like a simple word to the wise. Remember that old saying, a word, I think it's an old saying, I don't think it's scripture. My mama said so much, a word to the wise is sufficient. A word to the wise is enough. In other words, I don't have to beat this into you. I'm just going to give you this little, just to tell you, just to tell you. Correction. When you keep giving correction to someone, and they keep defying you. They are fools. Especially if you're a supervisor over them. And they're working for you or laboring for you. Or they're under your spiritual authority or parental authority. Your blood has not changed their character. Confrontation doesn't change a fool. The confrontation of the prophet to David regarding his sin with Bathsheba changed him. 
He began to weep. He began to cry. Confrontation affects a wise man. Confrontation is your attempt to salvage a life. When I called the young protege minister into my office and I confronted him and I really confronted him, when I see what makes others unravel around this place, shoot. I give him a thread. This guy got three ropes. You can't put a one next to a ten. They both strip out. I said, I'd be lying if I told you I needed you. I'd also be lying if I said you didn't need me. But I am desperate to get you into the future. I said, you're a half a century old and don't have a thing, a cotton picket thing to show for. Did you know confrontation won't change a fool? He becomes more clever, skillful. Confrontation to a fool is like telling the thief where the camera is. <laughs> He doesn't quit stealing. He goes under the camera. <laughs> How do you react to confrontation? I find confrontation easy. I have to avoid it to salvage people. Because if I confront somebody, I deal with it. I deal with it in a way that they don't forget. And if they're weak, they don't recover. So I put, I put other things. I distribute my confrontation to others on staff. Because if I confront somebody, I'm going to deal with you so thoroughly, you, won't, you, you may not recover from it. So I have to be very careful about my confrontation. Some of you have confronted people over and over and over. And I never forget the man who I love so much. He was my number one motivator in my life. Believed in me, still believes in me to this day. He should. Has no right, no, no reason not to believe in me. But I caught him with so many lies. It just, it just tore me apart. And uh, I had to deal with him. Don't try to build a relationship with liars. Stop building relationship with liars. Now you have to have, you have to have exchange. You can't go through this world without a bunch of liars in your life. It's they're everywhere. But don't build relationship with them. Don't try to build a foundation with them. I see men. There are churches that are called seeker friendly. I think it's a beautiful phrase, and I think it's a great idea and concept. Seeker-friendly churches, they usually have about 20-minute sermons. They don't preach strong doctrine. They don't, um, there's churches that try to use the vocabulary of welcome and invitation. And their goal is to get the people into their environment so they can begin to build a relationship and eventuate changes, eventuate conduct changes. For instance, a seeker church will never address adultery strongly. A seeker church will not address tithing strongly. They are seeker-friendly, which means they want seekers of God. They want a seeker-friendly environment so a person will not feel any condemnation. They grow quickly and rapidly because no one feels guilt, no one feels conviction. Everyone, they satisfy the conscience. In other words, a person feels bad away from God. They want to have some kind of contact with God. They just don't want change that God requires. You referenced it as repentance. But a seeker-friendly church does not stress repentance or change. A seeker-friendly church, it's a great concept, and they really grow. They grow 10, 20, 30,000. They're, they're, they are seeker-friendly. They're not teaching holiness, come apart from the world. 
They don't teach against drinking and gambling and cussing and you know they don't. They're they're you're gonna God's going God loves you. God's gonna, life is gonna go good for you, and you're gonna do great things. And life is everything's gonna be wonderful in your life. And and God loves you and He's caring for you. No matter what you've done, you're welcomed here. And uh, it's if you've made any mistakes, this is a place for you to be. I actually like seeker friendly churches. I just feel like. Uh, they may take a little long to bring change in behavior and conduct, and so a lot of people will still be here when the rapture takes place because they haven't had a real conscience. And they hadn't had a change. Confrontation is an attempt, but it won't change a fool. Four, a uh, dialogue will not change a fool. Dialogue. Conversation will not change a fool. That's why I said don't make friends with an angry man. Dialogue. Dialogue is a disguise and camouflage. It delays exposure. When a famous leader said the reason he had made such a horrible mistake and the reason he had sinned he says because I could but what an answer because I could that means if you could murder someone it's you have a right to do it because you could <laughs> you could rape somebody because you could dialogue won't change them the Bible and Paul tried every sincere man tries dialogue every man who cares tries dialogue dialogue is powerful it's magnetic. It's super, super strong. Dialogue has delayed wars. Dialogue has stopped wars. We know the potential of dialogue. We know the advantage of dialogue. If we can converse with good people and right people, Ronald Reagan was a master. He was called the great communicator, and he made a statement that was very electrifying. He said, "Never." He said, "It's impossible." I think he said, "It's impossible to overestimate the power of face-to-face -face conversation." That's why a politician who could reach 20 million in a TV conversation will get out on the streets, knock on doors, shake people's hands, how are you, hold people's babies, stroke a baby, love a little child, address a group, few women, because the power of face-to-face -face is so strong. And the law of 250 means that every person, every person has indirect influence on 250 other people so you can imagine face to face but dialogue doesn't correct a fool and when you've had 50 dialogues and 50 conversations and you've had 100 and you've had 200 and you don't see change can you accept that do you keep sowing do you keep investing money in a company that doesn't produce interest and a reward? No. Five, gifts do not change a fool. Gifts. I'm a firm believer in sowing into people you love. I'm a believer I buy suits. I do all kind of things for folks I love. The Bible talks about using a gift wrongly to pervert the ways or the words or decisions of the wise. Gifts can become bribes if someone is sowing into someone for the wrong reason. I don't really give gifts to open doors. I don't give gifts to correct behavior. I give gifts to reward behavior, reward conduct. I give gifts to document my respect and my caring. I give gifts to resolve a need and dissolve problems. I think gift giving is a marvelous thing. It's a blessing. It's a God thing. Satan has emulated it and copied it and imitated it. I think gifts given for the wrong purpose will produce wrong results. God gave his son, Jesus, and many have refused him. 
The gift was hanging next to one thief, two thieves. One rejected the gift. A gift doesn't help a fool. All great men know the power of a gift. Abraham did. Isaac did. Jacob did. When he thought Esau was going to come after him, destroy him, he sent gifts way ahead of him. He did not want to face Esau. Esau was a man of the field. Jacob was a man of the house. Esau was a rough character, confrontational. Jacob was a conversationalist. He was a master talker. He was a negotiator. He was a salesman. And he knew the power of a gift. All through Scripture, you'll find the power of a gift. You need to know this, that when you have a fool in your life, given a gift affirms them to themselves. They believe they have deceived you. They believe they have mastered you. They believe they've weakened you. Now they've depleted you. Stop giving gifts to fools. Stop giving gifts to a fool. We give gifts to try to show them we love them. We try to give gifts to show them we care. We try to give them gifts to show we're involved, we're committed, we interested in you. We give gifts to prove, to show potential, that we see potential. We see what you can become, what you can do. But remember, gift giving depletes your present inventory. So your gift should be a, a seed planted into your future. A gift should give longevity to a good relationship. A gift should strengthen. That's the purpose of gifts. I believe God gives us gifts so we can give gifts to others and get to know what it feels like to be God. But you must remember that the prodigal son had all the gifts of the father, and it did not change his character. It did not change his character. In fact, when you stop giving gifts, the fool will hate you. <laughs> I've never seen anybody yet that if you stopped giving to them, they'd get angry if they were fools, if they were fools. Six, love does not change the nature and character of a fool. David loved Absalom, but it didn't change Absalom. Jesus loved the rich young ruler. The Bible said it, he loved him, but it didn't change his character. Seven, instruction doesn't change a fool. Instruction. Clear, do this, do step one, do step two, do step three, do this and then we'll do this. I want you to do this. You give an instruction to a fool. <sighs> now some of you feel like the absence of a fool will be the absence of comfort. It won't. Give someone instruction. You go do this. No, I, 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 I don't think I should do that. Okay. Then you won't get the reward for following the instruction. Instructions are factory for change. An instruction is the catalyst for promotion. The Bible is a collection of instructions. Now, I give instructions in, in my world, in my environment, and my words matter. First thing you need to know about me is my words matter. I said what I believe in a minute. And if you'd like to dialogue, by the way, debate elevates a fool to your standard, your level. Don't enter into a debate with a fool. I laughing as someone says, why don't you debate some of these guys? I said, a debate requires two brains. Have you ever seen a mother debate with her five-year-old daughter? But I told you, we'll see. And she enters into a debate. Debate must be among equals. I don't debate my team. Why? There's a difference between the one who writes the check and the one who receives it. 
I don't debate an employee. You on payroll, we don't debate. You get an instruction. You follow it, you don't. You leave. And your departure is rarely a loss. First thing I see in an ignored instruction is a fool. Boy, this is rich, this is rich teaching, Mike. Don't quit, son. Eight, debate doesn't change a fool. Eight, information doesn't change a fool. Or will nine? Nine, information doesn't change a fool. Knowledge. I labor and I toil. This is why I'm so absolutely ecstatic. Brother Trevino, if you could get word to some of them, if we have enough of these today. These are $20 catalogs of all. It's, it's a treasure of knowledge. Did you know that all this knowledge and information, and I've documented so much it hurts. I cannot believe the things that are here. <coughs> Teachings. You cannot believe how much information is here. I actually have never seen any knowledge catalog like this in my lifetime. But did you know knowledge won't help a fool? Right. Knowledge of your preferences doesn't help a fool. I'm fascinated by people who tell me they love me but have no interest at all in what pleasures me. It's going to be very hard for all of you men and you that are watching, it's going to be very hard for you to accept people in your life are fools. I'll show you how to deal with them. Ten, time does not change a fool. That's why you have 80-year-old sinners, 75-year-old rebels, 90-year-old poor people, been here a century and have no money. Time doesn't birth knowledge. Gray hair doesn't make you smart. I see men with no hair that are smarter than men with gray hair. White hair don't make you bright. How should I react to a fool? There's so many scriptures. Proverbs 10:21 says that fools will die for want of wisdom. You're going to have to permit some to experience complete destruction of their life. Job 32.9 says, Great men are not always wise, neither do the aged understand judgment. Job 12.17 says, Some fools have been put in position of judges of others. Proverbs 3.35 said, Shame will be the promotion of fools. Psalms 107.17 says, Fools, because of their transgression, because of their iniquities, are afflicted. They will pay a price. Now here's some hope. God is the hope of the fools, not you. And this is some good news. Put them under God's supervision. This is a fascinating. Psalms 107. Lewis, I'll walk you through it. I'll walk you through the, read the whole scripture so you'll have it on CD. Did you get two CDs today? One? Okay, good. I'm about two minutes away. Verse 17, fools, because of their transgression, because of their iniquities, are afflicted. Their way shall correct them. Their soul abhorreth all manner of meat. They draw near into the gates of death. They're moving toward total destruction. Verse 19. Then, then, when they get close to loss and pain, then, then, notice the season for then, then, then they cry unto the Lord in their trouble. 
Does God boot them out? No. He saveth them out of their distresses. <laughs> Hallelujah. They got to hurt bad enough. Psalms 94, 8. Understand ye brutish among the people? Ye fools? When? When will you be wise? And then he answers it. When you get close to death. When you get close to loss. And if you cry. Ecclesiastes 7, 5 said it's better to hear the rebuke of the wise than for a man to hear the song of fools. Verse 6. For as the crackling of thorns under a, pool, a pot, so is the laughter of the fool. So the fool can appear to be joyous, happy, successful, but in God's eyes. There's so much. We were all famous with the most famous scriptures, a fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. Hmm. We release them to God. We stop investing our energy and our time where it doesn't produce a reward. This is going to help you more than you ever dreamed. It's going to take the burden of persuasion off of you. It's going to take the distraction of influence off of you. Let other people, they make their own choices. They make their way. Whew, hallelujah. Hallelujah. You're going to need to listen to this a while. You that are still watching are probably not fools. <laughs> the fools quit watching a long time ago. <laughs> I never tire of the wisdom of God. Wisdom is the ability to recognize difference, right and wrong, evil and righteousness, difference in people, difference in a countenance, difference in a moment, like the blind man crying out to Jesus. The dominant purpose for wisdom, and don't you love the wisdom of God? So thankful you're listening today and watching and being a part of the internet, telling others about it. And I hope you're getting, by the way, I hope you're getting my daily podcast every single day on your iPod or your MP3, every single day, two minutes of wisdom, be a blessing. Sometimes I go a little over because I get excited. I want you to be a part of this ministry. I believe that when you get involved with God, he gets involved with you. I am one of the ministers of the gospel who believe the words of Jesus. I believe every word he said. When he told Peter that there would be a hundredfold return on any investment in the gospel, in Mark 10, 28 through 30, I believed him. When the word of God says in Malachi 3, that if I bring the tithe, which is 10% of my income, and the offering back to him, that he would open the windows of heaven and pour me out a blessing I don't have room enough to receive, I believe him. Why would I believe God about heaven and hell and not believe him about the blessing of the Lord? I want to pray over the seeds that you have been planting in this ministry. And by the way, I have an incredible gift you're going to love. In fact, it's probably one of the greatest gifts I've ever offered. We're asking the Holy Spirit for 300 partners this week who will set aside a seed of $300 for our outreaches. I need your help. I want you to help me. Not just to feed a thousand children a day, which we do, or a thousand families, or underwrite the wisdom of Asia Bible College, or to underwrite the tent factory in South Africa, or the home of hope, but that we can go into 100 countries with the gospel. I'm holding in my hand the wisdom quick scan Bible. The wisdom quick scan Bible. I have never in my life found a Bible easier to read. As you know, for many years, I've read the Bible through 40 chapters a day, every single month of my life. There is no easier book to read than this quick scan Bible. When I found out that I could offer it to you inside of some of the teaching that I've been doing and I'll do today, I want you to have it. Call me right now, plant your seed of 300 and watch God move. Imagine, 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 imagine. I'm on Twitter 
and I want you to imagine with me, four o'clock in the morning, you wake up, ah, Mike Murdoch had a thought. I would love for you to follow me on Twitter. I think it's worth it.